Hello and welcome to English Literature with Susan. Uh, today I'm going to finish reading a Wasteland. So this is the uh, my explanation of the fifth and last part of the poem, what the thunder said. Uh, the thunder naturally <laughs> doesn't say anything, uh, but it has a sound. Uh, so uh, in, in this part, he said it is suggesting um, a kind of hope maybe, or um, a kind of, uh, way of getting out of this wasteland. Uh, he introduces three different alternatives, uh, the uh, the religious messiah, the Christian one uh, as a savior and, and, and the figure of Jesus Christ as one. Uh, the second savior uh, appears and is suggested through mythology. So we have the option or the alternative of the myth as well. And finally, um, the, he, he takes it to um, oriental mysticism and uh, some, some Eastern religions uh, and their, their beliefs. So uh, these three alternatives are suggested and we, the one by one we check out whether they would solve the problem of the wasteland or not. Uh, and the title of, the, of this part is also suggestive because it, it goes back to uh, actually it, it's, an, it's an allusion to the Upanishads, uh, uh, one of the uh, one of uh, one of the religious books or holy books of the people in India on, or some other places in the world. Uh, and anyway, uh, it is also prominent that uh, in order to get out of the space, then we may, uh, maybe we are supposed to listen to the voice or the sound of nature. Uh, T.S. Eliot has a note about this part. Uh, we can check out one, one by one uh, what Eliot has explained here. So let us move on. Um, the first part, uh, the, the actually uh, the, the, the first uh, stanza of the fifth part starts with a reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, after the shouting and the crying, prison and palace, and reverberation. Oh, many sounds in the poem. Uh, of thunder sprang over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. Uh, it's a direct reference to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So after the crucifixion, we may expect a raising or uh, a, com a second coming or something. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. Uh, so just after mentioning that Jesus Christ is crucified, he says, here is no water. So it seems that uh, the, the, this crucifixion, this uh, becoming the scapegoat for mankind, sacrificing yourself for mankind is not working. Here is no water because again, there is no water in the wasteland. Here is no water, but only rock. rock and no water, and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. You see the presence or the repetition of the term water or things related to water, but there is no water. This is ironical. If there were water, we should stop and drink amongst the rock. One cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry. Even in this wasteland, sweat is dry, and feet are in the sand. If there were only water among the rocks, and mountain, mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit. And here, Eliot uses a kind of uh, conceit or a metaphor. Uh, he he, he uh, suggests that, um, that we can imagine these mountains without water or like uh, decade teeth and the, the, as if you're in a mouth or something and this mouth is full of decade teeth i know this this is ugly and uh, disgusting but this is the image of the wasteland and in this uh, mouth uh, with the, with these decade uh, teeth uh, we can find no water so the, 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 these rocks cannot spit means that here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit there is not even silence in the mountains we have an image of the wasteland but dry strile thunder without rain so the thunder is not bringing rain at least at this part of the poem uh, there is not even solitude in the mountains but red sullen faces near and snarl 
from doors of mud rock, mud cracked houses, if there were water. And you see even, uh, actually he uses a conditional sentence. It is the second type of the conditional sentence, if there were water. So it, it means that it's impossible maybe. And no rock, if there were rock and also water. This part is a reference to the second stanza of the poem in which he, in, in, we have a biblical allusion to the part which says that if there was, if there, if there is a Messiah, you can find his presence like a water under a red rock or like like a, um, a place in which you can take some rest. It, it's it's like a shadow in a in a in a desert. But here we see that this is not happening. So the biblical, um, uh, the, the the biblical kind of. Uh, solution or the uh, what the Bible uh, has suggested is not working here. If there were rock and also water, and water, and you see different bodies of spring, a spring, a sorry of water, a pool among the rock. If there were the sound of water only, even if even if, even there is no sound of water, you cannot hear it. Not only we cannot see it, but but they cannot hear it. <laughs> there is not even a mirage, or there is not even a, a, maybe a real sound of water, not the cicada. And the cicada was also mentioned in that part that in, in the place that just as you see the sound of the cicadas, you can find a messiah. But it seems that the cicada um, is winning over the place. And dry grass singing. So we, the, we, we have different sounds but no sound of water some of them may also may be also similar to the sound of the water and dry grass singing but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees drip drop drip drop drip drop drop uh the the hermit thrush over the over the pine trees is making a sound which is similar to uh, the drops of water to the falling of the drops of water but it's not actually it so we have two different sounds this one and this one So there, there is a similarity, but this is not the sound of water, but there is no water, as the poem also admits. And here we have uh, that episode related to the journey to Emmaus. Uh, it, actually, it is, uh, uh, it is a part in which uh, uh, we have another allusion to a religious story. A question story actually where after his crucifixion Jesus Christ uh, appeared uh, walking side by side um, in, uh, his actually friends or the ones who were following him as a prophet uh, but um, but they could not recognize him who is the third who walks always beside you <coughs> I'm sorry when I can't there are only you and I together but when I look ahead up the white road, there is always another one walking beside you, gliding wrapped in a brown mantle, a brown mantle because uh, Jesus Christ's mantle was bloody and uh, it, because he was bleeding while dying. So the brown mantle and who did? Who did uh, is a reference to uh, the, that crown of thorn put over the head of Jesus Christ. I do not know whether a man or Roman, but who is who is that on the other side of you? So the Messiah is in there, but the people cannot recognize him. So the problem um, is persisting in Wasteland for this reason. Maybe we cannot um, discern the figure of the Messiah here. And uh, this is how maybe, maybe we are not certain, but maybe the religious alternative in the poem is rejected. And then we have another vision of the wasteland. What is that sound high in the air? Murmur of maternal lamentation 
were those hooded hordes swarming over the endless plains, tumbling in the cracked earth, ranked by the flat horizon only. Uh, we had uh, such a vision also suggested in Madame Sosa's dress part in the second section of the poem, in the first section of the poem. What is the city over the mountains, cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air? A violet air is a reference once again to the sunset, and this is um, and it, it, actually one of the various uh, and references to the sunset in the poem, falling towers. Uh, whenever in the poem till this point, uh, there was a reference to the unreal city, that unreal city was London. But it seems that uh, now this is not only London, uh, but the wasteland is extending, extending itself uh, historically and also geographically. So across history and across lands, wasteland is everywhere falling towers, Jerusalem, and um, important places for the world history. Jerusalem as, as a permanent kind of location uh, for Christianity, for Islam, for Judaism, uh, is, is now a falling tower. Athens, they, which was the cultural uh, backbone of Europe, also uh, is following the same future. It is falling. Alexandria, another important place in Africa for its uh, lighthouse and uh, its libraries, and Vienna, which is a modern capital of the world, London. All of them are unreal. So if you're extended to the Eastern Europe and even to the uh, Northern parts of Africa, uh, and we see that um, culturally speaking, everything is now into the waste. And after that, uh, we, we have that mythological alternative suggested in the poem. Uh, it's, a relation, it's related, that's part is related to the quest for the Holy Grail. The quest for the Holy Grail uh, is related to the Fisher King theme of the poem, the Fisher King whose lands were uh, decaying and has sent different knights uh, to, to find the Holy Grail. Holy Grail as a reminder. Uh, because of its cup shape, um, is res which resembles uh, the womb of a bowman as a sign, a symbol of fertility. And here the knights are searching for that symbol. Uh, there were other references throughout the text of the poem to this myth as well, uh, to the order to the search for the Holy Grail. A woman drew her long black hair out and uh, tight and fiddled whisper, uh, whisper music on those strings. And bats with baby faces in the violet light, sunset again, whistled and beat their wings and, and crawled head downward down a blackened wall. And upside down in air were towers tolling reminiscent bells that kept the hours. Um, well, the, the towers uh, which are upside down can be a reference both to the real towers which, which actually tolling reminiscent bells or also uh, what the bats do when, uh, when they want to sleep, they just uh, hang upside down from the ceiling or somewhere, uh, that kept the hours and voices singing out of empty cisterns. And cisterns are, are empty even in the realm of the myth and exhausted wets. In this decade hole among the mountains, in the faint moonlight, the grass is singing over the tumbled graves, about the chapel, there is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. Uh, this chapel, which is the wind's home, is a reference uh, to the chapel Pyrrhalus in the uh, in the story of the Fisher King, in which the questing knight sees nothing but decay, and it's, it's a moment of hopelessness because they have the illusion that there is nothing and the whole quest for finding the Holy Grail was a, a futile one. So here we are on the verge of hopelessness. It has no windows and the door swings. Dry bones can harm no one. Oh, another form of a baseland. Only a cock stood on the roof tree, 
Kakariko, Kakariko. Uh, these, um, this sound can suggest to or can be an allusion to two uh, different um, texts. The first one is the text of Hamlet. In the text of Hamlet, when, when we hear the sound of a cock, um, the, the uh, spirits have to go back uh, to, uh, to their graves or to, to where they are living. Uh, and that's why the bones can harm no one. And uh, there is also a reference to a biblical text in which it is suggested that the cock crows after Peter betrays Jesus three times. So Coco Rico, Coco Rico can be again a reference back to the crucifixion of Jesus Christ and also the story of Hamlet. But both of them are, are suggesting the same thing uh, that that. Uh, there is maybe uh, not even the sound of the spirits there. There is nothing in there. The moment of nothingness, uh, the moment of hopelessness, the moment of shattering and ruin, all of them can be suggested anyway. We are in the context of the wasteland, even, even if this wasteland is set or located uh, as part of the mythology. In a flash of lightning, then a damp gust bringing rain. So there is a damp gust, there is a lightning, and we have the hope of rain to come but uh bringing rain it's something which may happen in the future and it is after this part uh that we move to uh to the ganga where are, the rain is supposed to actually happen or we, where we can hear uh, uh the, the sound of the thunder what the thunder said ganga or the, the river ganges was sunken and the limp leaves waited for rain. Uh, there, there is no rain. There, there have been uh, no rain for a long time. So, uh, so the height of the water is is not as it was ever. That's why uh, the, the river is sunken and the limp leaves, uh, because limbs are uh, leaves are limp because they cannot move easily. Waited for rain while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. Himavant is the Hima uh, Himalayan peak. Uh, the jungle crouched because of the sound, because of the power, humped in silence. Then spoke the thunder. Da. The thunder, as I told you, says da, da, da. But this, this, ha this is actually an allusion to uh, three different das, da, ta, da, yadvam, dam, yata. Give, sympathize, and control. And it seems that these are the three ways of going out of the space land. So it is um, over our own control. We cannot search for a Messiah. We cannot wait for that Messiah to come to save us from this condition. We should give, we should sympathize, and we should control ourselves and our hearts so that uh, we can end this wasteland. The fable of the meaning of the thunder is found in uh, some book in the Upanishad and the Hindu fable found within the ancient sacred Sanskrit dialogues known as the Upanishads. The supreme deity uh, Prajapati gives instructions in the form of the syllable da, uh, which the gods understand as be restrained, damyata, humans as give alms, data, and demons as have compassion, the yadava. All are correct and a divine voice repeats the syllable with the force of thunder. Okay, so this is the story of what the thunder said. And then the three does, the first one, which is data, what, which means to give. Um, what have we given? So we, we have to be generous. My friend, blood shaking my heart, the awful daring of a moment surrender, which an age of prudence can never retract by this. And thus only we have existed, which is not to be found in our obituaries, uh, as you see a notice of death, or in memories draped by the beneficent spider. So the, what, what we can find as, um, as helping us cannot be found um, in places which talk about us officially or known or about or with the, uh, by the people who really know us. This is an act maybe happened somewhere when some when no one could see you, but you have done something. Or under seals broken by the lean solicitor, 
in our empty rooms. So the moment when the lawyer opens the bill, the, the, anyway, after your death, nobody would talk about what you've given. But what, what is important is that what you've given can save you from, uh, from actually a bad life, maybe. Uh, and the second duh is sympathize. The Yadavan. I have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only. Uh, this, this, uh, there are two references here. I have heard the key. Actually, there are two stories behind it. Uh, the first one is the, sto the story of Ogolino in uh, Dante's Divine Comedy. In that work, um, there is a, Dante finds a figure called, in, in the hell, in the inferno. Dante finds a figure called Ogolino. Then he asks him, and, and Ogolino is actually, um, and his, uh, his enemy, are um, are supposed to in the, when they are hungry are supposed to eat from each other's uh, heads so they, they they are supposed to to, to uh, actually eat um, eat from the body of the enemy and uh, he narrates his story to Dante Ogolino was sent to prison and um, he was uh, was condemned to to die with hunger but he didn't know that he and his five children was in there. And his sons one one by one died, but nobody uh, would bring any any food for them. They actually, when they heard the key, the key was locking the door. But but they thought that maybe it was bringing some food for them. So nobody sympathized them. And now he's in hell uh, with his enemy and eating um, his brain. So so that that was the story that nobody could sympathize with him, and he and his children died. And it can also be a reference to F.H. Bradley's a philosophy of appearance and reality. Bradley believed that um, uh, we are too private in our languages, in our ways of living, that everyone, uh, everyone has his own private system of speaking, his private or her private system of thinking. That's why we cannot establish a dialogue. That's why we cannot talk with one another, because our languages are private, personal. And uh, in order to end the space, then we, we have to sympathize. In order to to uh, to stop that prison to continue in our minds, they, they, that to uh, actually throw that prison away, uh, we have to sympathize. And if we sympathize, we can start a dialogue. And don't don't forget that in the in the previous parts of the poem, the, uh, the uh, starting of a dialogue or a conversation between two uh, couples uh, was what uh, what was also uh, uh, what could in intrigue actually a sexual relationship and therefore the ending of the wasteland. And so that, that this is the story of the key, turning the door once and turn once only. We think of the key, each in his present, thinking of the key, each confirms a present. Only a nightfall, ethereal, rumors revive for a moment of a broken Coriolanus. So if we cannot sympathize, we are broken. And Coriolanus uh, was actually a Roman soldier. He uh, he was rejected in his own land and then he fought for another nation. Uh, his land, uh, he felt rejected and he was rejected. And in the second country for which, um, for the neighboring country for which he fought, they were also suspicious of him because they thought that maybe uh, if, if he's not accepted by his own people, he's not a good option. So so he was very lonely and he, he his uh, tragic flaw was his pride. He was too proud to understand all these things and therefore his tragedy before. Uh, the story um, is narrated by Shakespeare and has play Coriolanus. So Coriolanus is an example of someone who could not sympathize and he was ruined by his pride. And the last da damiata control. Generally, uh, this part suggests that a well-controlled uh, beat, uh, a boat, um, is similar to a well-controlled heart. And the beat of the, if the beat of the heart is, if the beating of the heart is controlled, then you would not betray you. You would not be lustful, something like that. So uh, again, another suggestion to go out of this way. Then damiata. The boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar. The sea was calm. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, waiting obedient to controlling hands. So control your heart as a suggestion. And now we can read the last stanza of the poem. The last stanza of, the, of this poem is, is actually a gathering of different fragments of the poem. So th there is almost a reference to many of the themes of the poem. Uh, the first one is the Fisher King. I sat upon the shore fishing, 
with the arid plain behind me? Shall I at least set my lands in order? So this, uh, this first part is related to the fertility myth and what was uh, the story of the Fisher King and the search for the Holy Grail. Uh, long London bridges falling down, falling down, falling down is part of a, actually a song. Uh, and in the next part, uh, next actually parts of this song, we see a woman who is imprisoned. So there is a reference to that imprisonment as well. And don't forget that London was uh, unreal and, the, and we had the falling bridges in the poem. So a reference to that part. Uh, I don't dare to read Italian. Uh, this line, line actually, um, uh, if line, line 428 of the poem is a direct uh, citation from Dante's Divine Comedy. But interestingly, this part is uh, cited not from his Inferno, the, all the other references to Dante's Divine Comedy uh, till this point in the poem were from the Inferno. But here we have a, such, um, a, a citation from the Purgatorio uh, that that moment of hopefulness is in there. So uh, there is maybe uh, some um, some saving from that infernal fire but and we can find uh the, the the chance to live in the purgatorio and it is important because uh the difference between the people who were living in the inferno and the people who were living in the purgatory in dante's divine comedy is that there is no hope abandon your hope uh, oh oh hope uh, is what is suggested at the at the dooryard of the hell uh so there, there is no hope for the people who are living in the in the uh in that place and and in the infernal because uh they, they are still aware of their sin and they are proud of it so they, they cannot go out of the infernal the fire in which they are living but in the purgatory though the people the people are also tortured but the point is that they are um, they are now controlling themselves they are now learning how to get out of that condition how to how to go step up towards uh, actually the paradise. So, um, and th there is a hope here. We can read uh, this note. Elliot here quotes the final lines of Dante's encounter with the late 12th century poet Arno Daniel encountered among the lostful in purgatory. And so I pray you by that virtue which guides you to the top and, uh, and lustfulness in purgatory again controlling hand i pray you by that virtue which guides you to the top of the stair and there were other references to lustfulness in the poem the whole part three of the poem was about lust be reminded in time of my pain and the and the fire burning 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 if you remember so this is a reference to the, this is actually bringing to mind those parts of the poem then he hid himself in the fire that purifies them so the fire is purifying and not burning. Uh, this last sentence uh, translates line 428 of the wasteland. So um, and let me read it once again. And so I pray you by that virtue which guides you to the top of this stair, be reminded in time of my pain. So maybe there is a hope to go up the stairs and uh, the, in this Latin part and then uh, o swallow swallow. Uh, the Latin part is uh, uh, taken from the Vigil of Venus, an anonymous Latin poem, celebrating the spring festival of the goddess Venus. Again, spring and the goddesses. Uh, fertility ends with an allusion to the Procne, Philomela, Terrier myth. So there were various references to this myth in the poem as well. The coded line means, when shall I become like the swallow? The Latin continues that I may cease to be silent and the swallow could start to talk to, to to talk about the story um, she had undergone uh, the story of lustfulness and betrayal uh, and we have a French uh, French uh, line here Le Prince uh, d'Aquitan à uh, la tour a boy a bully sorry it's as uh, is translated as the prince of Aquitania in the ruined tower we have ruined towers other in other places in the poem and the prisoners of the mind in in the uh, uh, actually the fifth part of the poem where we, you know, the poet was talking about sympathy um and uh, it, it, this part is taken from one of the works of Gerard de Naval, the French writer, and, and actually T. S. Eliot is using it to, to, to just remind us of some of the, um, of the other themes of the poem. These fragments I have shored against my ruin. So T. S. Eliot here confesses that the poem is full of fragments and, the fra and now he has some reminders for those fragments here. And then and is, there is another allusion, why then have that you 
Hieronymus Madigan. Hieronymus Madigan is a subtitle of a play called Spanish Tragedy by Thomas Keith. Um, Spanish Tragedy is actually the model for Shakespeare's Hamlet. But, but the things are happening uh, in Spanish Tragedy in a different way. Here, the, the son is killed and the father is in search of a revenge and the father can uh, make it uh, to, to revenge the murderers of his son. Uh, Hieronimo actually um, had some fits of madness in the story and Hieronimo's Madigan is a reference to that. But by the way, um, Hieronimo also made some fragments. Hieronimo had a puzzle uh, to, to, for his revenge. He actually uh, tried to write a play or, uh, or devise a play to be performed anyway. And he asked the murderers of his son to take a, take a role in that play. And it was interesting that they accepted anyway. And they, they, they thought that it's fun that Hieronimo is reconciling with them. Uh, but, but the play uh, moved in a way that Hieronimo, uh, with the help of um, his uh, deceased son's fiance, killed every one of them. So, or, or some of them killed one another. So it, it was the case that he made, um, he, he made it. He, ma he had a puzzle, he had some fragments, he, put, he juxtaposed them uh, in, an, in a very organized and orderly way so that uh, he could um, have his targets accomplished. And that is the case with T.S. Eliot. He thinks that by, pu by putting these fragments side by side, he had uh, given us um, a clear image of what is happening in the wasteland. And then data uh, and the puzzle is uh, now and uh, now finished. Data dayadavam damayata. These are the ways to go out of this condition to give, to sympathize, and to control. And the poem uh, ends with uh, another uh, actually Oriental uh, Sanskrit uh, word shanti shanti shanti. Shanti means a peace that passes understanding. So if if we give, if we come, if we have compassion, and if we control ourselves, our hearts, then uh, we will reach a kind of peace which passes understanding, and then the wasteland would have ended. So that was my explanation of the uh, of the last part of the wasteland. I hope I have clarified some of uh, the vague points of the poem, and I hope I can see you in my next videos.